Hello and welcome to lecture 60 of uh, analog integrated circuit design. Hello and welcome to lecture 60 of uh, analog integrated circuit design. This will be the final lecture of this course. In this lecture, we will uh, finish some of the unfinished threads from uh, earlier lectures and also summarize the course. In the previous lecture, we were talking about discrete time filters that is implementing discrete time filters using switched capacitors and op amps and uh, we discussed how to generate the topologies for uh, bilinear transform filters and so on. What we will discuss now is one particular detail of uh, implementing uh, switch capacitors which will reduce the errors. We know that uh, a switch capacitor filter consists of uh, units like this. I will show just one uh, switch capacitor unit which can be part of an integrator. And let me label these let us say phi 1, phi 1, phi 2 and phi 2. Okay. Now, in reality these switches will have to be implemented using MOS transistors. So, what happens is that all these switches are implemented using MOS transistors. Now, we know that if you have a MOS transistor switch and the switch will be on if this VGS is sufficiently uh, higher than V T. Okay. And you would like to have as large a VGS minus V T as possible, so that the on resistance of the switch is small. So, if you have an NMOS transistor to turn it on you would tie the gate to VDD and if you have a PMOS transistor you would tie the gate to 0 volts or ground. Okay. So, because of this what happens is that if the voltage at the terminal of the switches let us say V1 is close to VDD the NMOS transistor is going to be off or at least will operate with a very small VGS. Okay very small VGS minus V T. So, that means that the switch resistance will be rather high. Okay. So, the NMOS switch is good when V 1 is close to ground and the PMOS switch is good when V 1 is close to V D D. Okay. So, depending on the voltages that you want to switch you may have to use an NMOS switch or a PMOS switch or a combination of the two. Okay. So, if your V 1 occupies the entire range or a significant part of the range from uh, uh, 0 to V D D then what you would do is use a parallel combination of P and NMOS and tie this to V D D and tie this to ground in order to turn it on. Okay. So, in this case for low values of V 1 the NMOS switch will be active for high values of V 1 the PMOS switch will be active and you can work with a larger range of V 1 okay. and this is known as a transmission gate. Switch. Okay. Now, typically what happens is that we will as usual have a fully differential implementation and this point I will show a single ended circuit for simplicity, but this point will be at the common mode voltage of the op amp the input common mode voltage of the op amp okay. and these things will be connected to common mode as well. Okay. Now, this switch the first switch here is connected to the input V i 
so it has to handle the voltage range that is occupied by the input voltage whereas if you look at these other switches they are connecting uh, this point to the common mode voltage okay so they do not have to handle a large range of uh, voltages so typically this has to be a transmission gate switch and these can be single channel switches and if the common mode happens to be closer to VDD you would use a PMOS switch and if it happens to be close to ground you would use an NMOS switch if it is in the middle both are equally bad but an NMOS may be better because of its higher mobility which means that it will have a lower resistance okay. So that is one particular practical aspect in implementing these uh, switches. Now when you implement these with uh, MOS switches I will show single channel switches everywhere just so that the diagram is simpler but it is understood that the input switch is usually a transmission gate switch. This will be the common mode voltage of the op amp and I am showing a single ended uh, implementation but it is understood that we will in practice make everything differential okay. Now whenever a MOS transistor switch is on that is let us say an NMOS transistor whose gate is connected to VDD so this is on it will have a charge whose magnitude equals the gate capacitance times the overdrive voltage okay. The overdrive voltage depends on the voltage to which the gate is connected and also the voltage to which the drain and source are connected when it is on this voltage and that voltage will be approximately the same okay. So I will call both of them V1. Now if you examine the charge on each of these this one will have a channel charge which is WLC aux VDD minus the input voltage minus VT when it is on and all of these things will have a channel charge that is VDD minus VCM minus VT okay. So the important difference is that the channel charge of this is dependent on the input signal whereas the channel charge of these switches is not dependent on the input signal it is some fixed value okay. You cannot determine precisely what it is but you know that it is some fixed value because the drain voltages are some fixed value VCM okay. Now what happens when a transistor turns off remember when the transistor uh, when this transistor turns off that is when the voltage across this is uh, held to the value of the remember the sampling instant is determined by the turning off of the switch okay. When the switch is turned on uh, when phi 1 is high the voltage here is VI and here it is 0 and when phi 1 becomes low these become open circuits and the sampling instant is when phi 1 turns low okay at that point the value of VI is stored on this. But also what happens is when a transistor turns off let us say it is on and it goes to off so this QI will go from whatever value it had to 0 okay. So it has to go out of the drain and source terminals and it turns out that I will show whatever is connected to either side by some impedances Z1 and Z2 okay. and a certain amount of charge will go that way I will call it Q1 and I will call that Q2 the sum of Q1 and Q2 will be QI. So it turns out that the part that goes out as Q2 will be much smaller than Q1 if 
the impedance z2 is much higher than z1 okay so the bottom line is charge tends to flow into the side which has a lower impedance connected to it okay now there are papers which analyze this phenomenon in detail you can consult them if you want the details of this but the summary is that if you don't want the charge to go to some place you would like to establish a high impedance at that point okay now just now i said that when the switch opens the value of vi is established on the capacitor but it's not just the value of vi any charge that flows out of the switch will also go and sit on the capacitor okay so the sample value will be in error okay and this happens everywhere you have you have switch capacitors any switch that turns off also injects an error charge into uh, the capacitor and exactly how much it is depends on the relative impedances and so on so the main problem here is that the charge in this is dependent on the signal and it's usually not such a simple dependence it will have some nonlinearity as well so when you turn off this switch you will get some error which is typically nonlinear on c1 okay so in order for the charge from this not to flow to that side what you would like is to have a high impedance looking to the right okay that is looking that way you should have a high impedance and that can be established by turning off this switch whatever is labeled as phi1 here near the virtual ground before you turn off that one okay although both are labeled phi1 in practice what you do is you turn off this switch before that one so once this is turned off looking this way it's an open circuit and when then you turn this off turn off this switch and most of its charge will go into the left side whatever is providing vi okay and nothing will go into c1 so the sample value will be accurate so it, in general it turns out that the switches that are connected to the virtual ground should be turned off before the switches that are connected to the other side the input side okay remember in uh, some uh, uh, configurations this could be phi1 and in others this could be phi2 and so on so it is very typical to have two versions of uh, uh, phi1 that is you have something that turns off early for the for use on the right side on the virtual ground side and you have something that turns off late for use on the input side okay so in a practical switch capacitor filter although we uh, initially labeled everything with two phases phi1 and phi2 you will have four phases now first of all let's say this is phi1 and phi2 will be like that okay there will be a certain non overlap and this is required because you see that this is phi1 and that is phi2 if the two are on simultaneously it will short circuit the input okay so that's absolutely unacceptable so there has to be overlap between phi1 and phi2 on top of it you also have two additional phases i'll show it as a smaller than the other phi1 let me call it phi1e and similarly phi 2e okay and the point here is to have a gap between these two okay phi 1e turns off before phi 1 and similarly here phi 2e turns off before phi 2 okay and this is used for the virtual ground switches and this is used for the input side switches okay 
So this is something very important in switch capacitor filters you have to do this in order to reduce the errors due to what is known as charge injection. This phenomenon of stored charge inside a MOS transistor coming out when the switch turns off is known as charge injection and charge injection flows out of both drain and source but it flows more into the side which has lower impedance. So if you do not want the charge injection error to appear in some place you should make sure that that side has a high impedance okay so that is the general principle. And by the way these are the control voltages for an NMOS switch that is let us say when I have a switch labeled phi 1 what it means is that I could have an NMOS switch with phi 1 as the control voltage where phi 1 goes from 0 to VDD or a PMOS switch with phi 1 bar as the control voltage or a transmission gate with phi 1 controlling the NMOS and phi 1 bar controlling the PMOS okay. So you can see that uh, although ideally you label the phases in the switch capacitor circuit phi 1 and phi 2 you can end up with a lot of phases you have uh, phi 1, phi 2 and the early versions phi 1E and phi 2E and also the complemented versions uh, if you have both N and PMOS switches okay. So that brings us to the end of uh, discrete time filters we have dealt with them very briefly it is just an introduction that will help you start off with if you read other reference books and papers okay with this you should be able to at least understand how discrete time filters can be designed okay and then with a little bit of extra material you should also be able to design them and go and simulate them okay. There will be handouts in addition to this course which will tell you how to simulate switch capacitor filters. The next thing that we look at is how to choose transistor sizes in a circuit okay. We have made a number of circuits mainly op amps and transconductors and also transistors were used to make current sources and so on. Now we have to choose transistor sizes and so far we have used the square law model as some kind of guidance but first of all we know that the square law model itself is highly oversimplified and especially when the channel lengths become very short it is quite inaccurate okay. So what is done in practice what a real designer would do is when you are exposed to some technology you first play around with it a little bit so that you get familiar with the parameters and then uh, when you want to start off uh, designing some circuit you choose the sizes accordingly that is what I am going to outline in the next few minutes. Now the square law model it says that the saturation current okay. In reality uh, many of these things are highly inaccurate first of all the square is not really true at short channel lengths and also ID is proportional to W this is more or less true when the transistor width is much more than the minimum width given in the given technology and this is usually true for analog circuits. But this the inverse proportionality to L this is not really true okay. It is true that ID increases if you reduce L but it is not true that it is exactly in inverse proportion okay. And then of course this is highly oversimplified as well okay. So what should you do what you must do is essentially calculate GM and other quantities of interest for a transistor using a simulator over a range of bias currents okay and this is something that you have to do anyway initially when you are exposed to a new technology you do this so that you get familiar with the possible parameter ranges and then you choose the transistor sizes properly okay. Now what parameters are we interested in usually GM is of primary interest uh, 
because in uh, analog circuits you have uh, gain to be gm times rl in a common source amplifier or gm by c as the unity gain frequency of an op amp and so on so gm is definitely of primary interest now another quantity of interest is gds or uh, many times you can think of gm by gds which is the inherent dc gain of a transistor this appears as uh, dc gain of uh, op amps and so on when it is loaded by itself okay that is when it's not operating with an external load so that's another quantity and also you have to be worried about uh, swing limits that is headroom issues so vgs minus vt and the absolute value of vgs are other uh, quantities of interest because these will uh, uh, tell you how much room you have uh, after allowing for these things for the signal swing okay and finally you have ft or gm by cgs as quantity of interest now ft does not directly tell you what frequency the circuit will operate at but it will only give you a guideline that is if you have a larger ft your circuits uh, frequency of operation could potentially be higher okay now typically uh, data sheets that uh, tell you about a technology also list the value of ft usually a single number is given but this is not very useful because that is evaluated with usually an unrealistically large value of vgs and vds and so on so again you evaluate this with the uh, values of vgs and vds that are reasonable okay now how do we go about doing this first of all you choose a channel length okay now again as i said although the square law model says that id is related only to the w by l ratio it is best to think of w and l as two separate parameters okay so you choose the channel length l based on some criteria i'll come to those things and then you can scale the parameters based on w okay because id will be proportional to w for instance let's say you start with the minimum channel length in some technology okay and then you bias at a given id and determine many parameters let's say gm and gds or gm by gds which is an indicator of the dc gain and ft or gm by cgs and sometimes you may also be interested in gm by gmb that is the bulk transconductance and also vgs and vgs minus vt and these are usually of interest for the swing limit and then you vary id over some range and plot these parameters okay now once you do this you will get an idea of how much gm you will get for uh, what id and what is the kind of gm by gds you can expect and so on and this process has to be repeated for a different length let's say you find that the gm by gds is rather inadequate then you have to increase the channel length and do this so typically uh, what i would do and what i would recommend that you also do is you choose the minimum length and maybe twice the minimum length four times the minimum length etc and then list all these parameters or plot all these parameters versus bias current okay and then you will get an idea of uh, what possible gms you can expect it also tells you whether you will be able to accommodate that in a given supply okay because you also plotted the vgs and vgs minus vt and so on okay so just to give you an illustration let me write down the final step here now how do we go about uh, simulating these things first of all you can bias a transistor at a given current using negative feedback okay so the transistor is real typically you choose something w much more than uh, w min 
okay and L of whatever value you want. So, let us say I start with L equals L min. and I will bias the transistor at a particular VDS that I would like to have. Okay. The reason is that I could have done this as well now if the current happens to be rather large what happens is that you will end up with a very large VDS usually you do not bias the transistor in an analog circuit with a very large VDS. Okay. Now you could do that the reason you do not do it is you would like to have as much headroom as possible okay. and when you reduce the VDS it does have some influence on the parameters. So, typically you do this with a reasonable value of VDS keeping that fixed although there is nothing wrong with using a diode connection. Okay. So, once you have this then this will get biased at A drain current of I bias VGS will get adjusted by negative feedback and let me call this VDS 0 VDS will be VDS 0 which you could choose to be a relatively modest value of let us say 0 0.2 volts or 0 0.3 volts. Okay. So, then depending on your simulator you could do various things first of all typically the simulator will let you evaluate the operating point simulate the operating point and report the value of GM. Okay. you can get GM and GDS also and of course from these you can calculate uh, GM by GDS you can also calculate GM by GMB if that is of interest to you and you can also calculate GM by CGS which is approximately the FT okay. and this FT is evaluated with a relatively small value of VDS and also uh, not the highest value of VGS that is possible okay. and you can also report the value of VGS and VGS minus VT okay. and you can plot these you can plot versus I bias but it is usually uh, better to plot it versus the current density okay, that is I bias by W because as I have said repeatedly all these things will scale right if you double the value of W keeping the VGS the same and VDS the same you will double the value of the drain current you will double the value of GM FT will remain the same and so on. Okay. So, you plot it versus the current density essentially this will tell you what current density to bias to get what value of FT okay. and then GM and ID can be scaled from this. Okay. Now, I will show you an example of uh, this which I have evaluated for some particular uh, process. So, this is exactly what I meant. So, here uh, the x axis is uh, shown as I bias okay, and this is for a 10 micron wide device. Okay. So, the current density can be calculated as I bias divided by 10 micron. So, like I said you could uh, plot it versus the bias uh, current per micron or versus the bias current itself either way it does not matter because everything will scale with the width. Now, what are these uh, different curves? The first one says it is FT, the second one is GM, the third is GM by GDS, fourth is GM by GMBS, and VD sat and VGS, and so on. Okay. So, let me start with the GM curve. What it says is for this particular transistor, as you increase the uh, bias current, okay, GM will increase, but after a certain point, it will start decreasing. Okay. This is partly because the transistor tends to go into a triode region as well the VGS starts increasing beyond a certain value okay. and also as you increase the value of uh, I bias the FT value goes on increasing. Okay. Now, if you are operating at high frequencies you would like to operate with as high an FT as possible. Okay. Like I said FT is, does not give you directly what frequency your circuit will operate at but it essentially gives you the relative size of the parasitics. Okay. If you have a large value of GM by CGS of the transistor that means that the transistor parasitics are relatively small okay. that is one way of thinking about it. So, at high frequencies you would like to have large GM by CGS so that it can drive some external capacitance 
or even the internal capacitance can be driven faster okay. So, this gives you an idea of uh, what uh, FT2 operated okay and similarly the value of GM by GDS tells you what value of uh, DC gain you can get if you bias this with a current source that is an ideal active load. Now, you can see that this is by the way for a transistor length which is the minimum in this particular process which happens to be 0.12 micrometers and you can see that the maximum value of GM by GDS is only about 13 or 14 okay and it uh, keeps falling as you increase the value of I bias it is constant up to some value and then it keeps falling. This is again is typical if you try to operate at a very high current density you will end up with a rather poor DC gain okay and GM by GM bias this tells you how much the influence of the back gate is this may be of interest in uh, cases where you have body effect in this case the GM bias is rather small compared to GM. Now the other important things here are the VD sat and VGS okay. So, what do these things tell you? Let us say you choose the peak of the FT curve that is you choose to bias it at 2 milliamp for 10 microns okay that is you choose to bias it at 2 milliamp for 10 micron width and this part is 10 micron because that is what I have simulated okay. In fact, a better way of thinking about this is to think of it as 200 micro ampere per micron width okay. So, it looks great because you get the highest GM by uh, CGS that is possible, but if you look there at uh, 2 milliamp the VGS value can be as high as 0.9 volts or so okay. Now, that may or may not be acceptable for you. By the way you see there are uh, many curves here there are 3 green curves and 3 red curves okay. Now, as I have mentioned in uh, an earlier lecture uh, dealing with the CMOS processes there will be process variations. What I have plotted here is for different process corners and also for different temperatures okay. Now, you do not have to do it for every possible uh, corner here the green curves correspond to a low temperature of 0 degrees and the red curves correspond to a high temperature of uh, 100 degrees okay. The reason to do this is that you also have to uh, deal with the worst case scenario okay. You can see that FT is low at a high temperature okay. So, this is what is going to be limiting your performance right and GM is also low at a high temperature and so on. So, if you do not want to calculate it over all the process corners and temperatures at least you could do it over the worst corner which is typically called the slow corner where the uh, mobility is rather low and also at the highest temperature which could be 70 degrees or 100, deg 100 degrees based on your interest okay. And you can do it for the worst case because there is no point simulating in the best case and then uh, you simulate in the other corner and finding that the circuit does not work anymore. So, you should have an idea of what the worst case is even before you start to design. So, here you see that the transistor uh, VGS is rather high and if you go to a higher current density it will be even higher the transistor VGS is even higher and you may or may not be able to accommodate that much VGS okay. Similarly, VD sat here is at this current density is about uh, 300 millivolts. So, if this is acceptable that is fine you could bias it and have a relatively uh, high frequency performance from your circuit otherwise you will have to back down from the peak current density you have to bias it at let us say 100 micro ampere per micron or something lower okay. Now, what else can you do with this? So, let us say you do in indeed choose to bias here. So, this gives you a GM of 5 milli Siemens that is for 10 micron width okay. So, you can think of it as 500 micro Siemens of a GM for a micron of width. So, depending on the GM value that you want you scale up the width. So, let us say you are interested in a transistor with a 50 milli Siemens GM what you must do is choose a 100 micron width and choose a bias current of 200 micro ampere per micron times 100 microns which is 20 milli amperes okay. So, that is how you would use these curves. So, like I said generating these curves itself is an educational experience you should do this for a given process then you will get a feel for this process. Now, having done all this then you look at the value of GM by GDS you get 
it is rather miserable it is just about 5.5 or so okay. So, even if you bias this transistor with an ideal current source active load the DC gain that you get will be 5.5 and this could be your limiting factor in some cases okay. It is not that in every case you would like to maximize FT or a GM for a given current okay. What you may want is high DC gain. So, for that reason you may have to choose a smaller bias current okay smaller bias current density what is important is the current density that is current per micron of width. So, let us say you would like to have as high a DC gain as possible then you would choose a different operating point. So, let us say somewhere here this is 100 micro ampere of current for 10 micron width or corresponds to 10 micro ampere per micron okay and in this case you will get a DC gain of about 13 which is still a relatively low value, but higher than before. Now, if you go back and look at the value of FT, now you see that you have come down significantly from there okay. And this also illustrates the trade offs if you would like to have a high DC gain you will end up with a slower device okay. So, that is another issue and similarly you will have a GM that is rather small okay. You will have to live with this value of GM instead of 5 milli Siemens it is maybe 1.8 milli Siemens or so. So, this is for uh, the minimum length and as you know uh, if you want a higher DC gain typically you would not choose the minimum length you would choose a longer transistor okay. So, what I have done is also evaluated this for approximately twice the minimum length and that is 0.25 microns. Okay. So, you notice many things immediately first of all uh, previously the peaks of FT and GM were occurring somewhere around a bias current of 2 milliamps okay. that is 200 micro amperes per micron. Now, here they occur slightly earlier okay. and also the values are lower. Okay. So, you see that this uh, worst case peak FT is almost uh, 75 gigahertz here whereas, here the worst case peak FT is some 22 gigahertz okay. So, you do fall significantly in the peak FT when you go to a longer channel length. Similarly, if you look at 1 milliampere bias current or 100 microampere per micron of bias current, the GM value here was about 5 milli Siemens whereas, here it is about 3 milli Siemens okay. Again I am only looking at the worst case there are 6 curves here for 3 corners and 2 temperatures, but worst case is what matters okay. Similarly, again you see that for 1 milliamp you already reach uh, VGS of uh, 800 milli volts or so and so on. But what is the advantage of moving to L equals 0.25 micron? The highest GM by GDS that you get is a lot higher okay, whereas previously you were limited to about 14. Now, if you operate with a 100 microampere bias current which corresponds to a 10 micro ampere per micron width you will get a DC gain of 40 which is a lot higher than before okay. So, if you want a large DC gain so let us say you are designing a cascode op amp where the DC gain is of the order of GM by GDS square and the DC gain you required was of the order of 1000 clearly each transistor must have a GM by GDS which is 30 or 40 or even higher okay because uh, what appears is uh, not just the GDS of a single transistor, but of many transistors. So, you would have to choose a longer uh, channel device, but this also means that you will be compromising on speed okay. So, this is a trade off that you cannot avoid, but these curves will help you uh, figure out which uh, transistor length to use and then from there you can scale up for a given GM okay. So, let us say you have decided to operate where the GM by GDS is around 40 that is 10 micro ampere per micron. So, that means that you will be operating somewhere here. So, this is let us say this is about 1.5 uh, milli Siemens it is a little less than that, but I will approximate it to 1.5. So, I have uh, 1.5 milli Siemens for 10 microns of width okay. So, that is 150 micro Siemens per micron width. I would like to keep the same DC gain GM by GDS, but I want a higher GM let us say to obtain the desired uh, unity gain frequency in an op amp. Then so let us say I wanted uh, 15 milli Siemens what I would have to do is 
use 100 micron width okay because I have to scale this up by a factor of 100 and I also have to scale up the current density by a factor of 100. I am operating at 10 microampere per micron and I have to operate this at 100 times higher current that is 1 milliamps of ID and at that point my VGS minus VT will be around 150 millivolts which is usually a rather acceptable value and you can comfortably bias the op amp okay. So this is how you would use these sort of cheat sheets right. Now if you look at the literature there is something known as the GM by ID methodology and it is something similar what you plot there is just the value of GM divided by ID versus the VGS or VGS minus VT okay. Now you can do that but the information that you will not get from there is the value of the inherent DC gain of the transistor that is information about GDS and so on. Now whichever you choose to use you have to generate these plots yourselves okay there is not much point looking for these plots for a given technology okay it is only by playing around with the technology yourselves that you will get a feel for what the process can do and where to bias the transistors and these simulations are rather simple and are an interesting way to get started with the process and also get useful information on how to start off your design. Just for completeness I will show you the curve for a an even longer channel transistor in this case I have used approximately 4 times the minimum length or 0.5 micron okay and the width is the same and you see that the peak FT comes down even more but the reason for going to a longer channel is the higher DC gain and you can see that you can get a DC gain of almost 7, 80, 75 or so okay in the worst case. So if you want a higher and higher DC gains you have to go to longer and longer channels and there is no end let us say uh, that you are looking mainly at DC gain performance and primarily not at speed then you can even increase the channel length and do these uh, uh, simulations okay. Once you do it for a few different channel lengths you will get a feel for uh, what you have to do and you want a DC gain beyond the values that are given by whatever you have simulated then you go to an even longer channel length okay. So that is quite easy you have to do this for both uh, PMOS and NMOS so that you have information on both because many times you use a PMOS input pair and NMOS input pair and uh, different loads and so on okay. So I would say that whenever you are introduced to a new technology a good point to start off with is to generate these curves of uh, GM, GM by GDS and FT and uh, also the bias values of uh, VGS minus VT and VGS for different current densities okay and you should try and simulate these things with a width that is much more than the minimum width because that is where the scaling with the width is valid. And it is also convenient if you plot these things versus the current density that is the current per micron of width rather than the current itself as I have done and then uh, that will give you a good starting point for all your designs okay. So that sort of brings us to the end of the course I will quickly summarize what we have done in this course and wrap it up. This is what we started off as course goals we wanted to learn about uh, how to design negative feedback circuits on CMOS ICs. Basically look at the principle of negative feedback for controlling the output to a desired value then design amplifiers and voltage references and some other circuits mainly learn the design of op amps and also we wanted to see how to make phase lock loops or basically frequency generation circuits using negative feedback and then some kinds of filters. Now what have we actually done we did uh, go through in great detail about negative feedback amplifiers we saw how to design amplifiers using negative feedback and dealt with stability and how to frequency compensate it that is to configure the negative feedback loop for stability. Then we saw uh, negative feedback circuits using op amps and op amp models that you can use. Then we saw how to make op amps on CMOS ICs uh, to do that first we went through the components that are available on a CMOS integrated circuits and device models uh, that you can use for the CMOS transistors and also some things that you would probably not be familiar with earlier but are relevant to IC design such as mismatch and noise. Then we saw a number of different kinds of op amps a single stage op amp and a cascode op amp which gives a higher DC gain and two and three stage uh, op amps with Miller compensation and two and three stage op amps with feed forward compensation okay different structures for getting higher and higher DC gains while maintaining stability. Then we looked at fully differential op amps common ways of analyzing fully differential circuits using a differential in common mode half circuits uh, 
and common mode feedback which is an essential part of all uh, fully differential circuits and fully differential uh, versions of the Miller compensated op amp and the feed forward compensated op amps. Then we looked at the phase lock loop as a problem of uh, frequency multiplication using negative feedback that quickly brought us to type 1 loop which was rather not practical and the type 2 loop which is uh, widely in use. Then we briefly looked at oscillators and also uh, the phase noise of oscillators and so on and we also looked at uh, the noise in a phase lock loop okay. The noise in the phase lock loop is in the phase domain and it is somewhat distinct from the voltage noise that you are familiar with in circuits. So we saw how to calculate those things and how to interpret the phase noise okay. We then came to applications we dealt with how to make a band gap reference that is a constant voltage reference on an integrated circuit. We also looked at how to make certain types of current references that is current references which are proportional to absolute temperature and which result in a constant GM when you bias a MOS transistor and so on okay. Then we also very briefly looked at continuous time filters and switch capacitor filters okay. So finally the point is what should you be able to do now if you have followed the course properly. You should certainly be able to analyze and design adequately stable negative feedback loops and design transconductors and op amps and also appropriate biasing circuits for these or any other circuits using transistors. You should also be able to design fully differential circuits and design common mode feedback circuits for them and also you should be able to analyze circuit noise and offsets based on the noise models okay. The type 2 PLL is something that we dealt with in detail so the basic type 2 PLL you should be able to do and simulate in the phase domain and if you come across other op amp architectures I think based on these you will be able to understand with a little bit of work and perhaps also understand other phase lock loops which may have some more details and refinements frequency synthesizers and clock and data recovery circuits which are a type of phase lock loop used with not a periodic input signal but with a random data input signal when you want to extract the clock that corresponds to the data. Here is some examples of circuits this is a voltage regulator with a band gap reference you should be able to in principle design this based on what you know so far and this is something that we have not dealt with at all a current steering digital to analog converter but basically it is a bunch of differential pairs and again you should be able to design these things so that it works properly and feedback amplifiers of course and then the continuous time filter. So the bottom line is you should be able to do some design. So besides the specific technical knowledge that you have acquired for design you should be comfortable with evaluating multiple options okay because there is no real one good option there are many topologies that different people have investigated which are suitable for different contexts and in fact you may yourself find that when you go from one process technology to another some topology is better than the what you used in the other process and so on okay. So what you need is basically sort of mental flexibility you should have multiple options on your hand you should also be comfortable with trial and error approach because you may not be able to analyze everything completely before you start off the design. So you design it a little bit and see how it goes and come back and iterate and so on and multiple ways of looking at building blocks so that you understand them thoroughly and you should also develop intuitive thinking and understanding and this is kind of related to what I mentioned earlier. If you uh, understand the same uh, circuit from different points of view you also gain valuable intuition about its operation and finally the last three are uh, very important for design and especially for coming up with new designs that may not have been done before at all okay. First of all uh, curiosity otherwise you will not be able to look at new things at all you should be open minded that you should not be so rigid about uh, uh, some circuits that you have already designed. You may you should be open to the possibility that there may be some other circuit that will work better in the given context and finally it should be thorough okay because many times superficially you can come up with a circuit idea but you have to evaluate it thoroughly to see whether it really fits in with the application that you have in mind okay. Now there are other op amp architectures I will just mention the class, class AB output stage this is something that we did not deal with in this course. It is mainly used when you have to deliver a very large load current this is the op amp that we have discussed in the course in great detail it is the two stage op amp the single stage op amp is shown as a transconductor here and it drives the second stage the main point is that the bias current of the second stage is fixed. So if you have to deliver a large current this I1 has to be more than that very large current so that leads to a very high quiescent power dissipation of the op amp. So 
the basic idea behind the class IV op amp is to not use a fixed current source here, but use a current source that is dependent on the signal. So, if you have a large signal, you make this current source large, and if it's the signal is not there, you keep it at a small volume. Okay. Now, in our traditional op amp, only the gate of the transistor M11 received the signal. Now, M12 also has to receive the signal around a different bias voltage VG12. Okay, you can't simply connect this to that one. That will also lead to a very large current. So there are many arrangements to do this, but one classic arrangement is what was publicized initially by Dennis Monticelli. It's a particular kind of biasing circuit which you apply the signal directly to the NMOS transistor here, and it also gets converted to the PMOS. And it turns out that you can adjust the quiescent current independently for the output branch. Okay, based on this one, and you can see the details in this particular paper. Okay. So this is a particular op amp of uh, tremendous practical interest that you can look up in the references. Now the basic principle is exactly the same as what we have done before. The output stage is different and the operation of that you can uh, look up from this reference and many other references in the literature. Okay. And these are some uh, general references you can use. This is a classic uh, tutorial on op amps which is still rather useful and this is about the class AV op amp. And this uh, the third one is in particular about uh, uh, op amps with multiple stages and then the last one is about feed forward op amps. Okay. So that brings us to the end of the course. Now besides these there will also be a detailed handout on op amps and one on phase lock loops that you can refer to. Okay. Hope you have enjoyed the lectures. Thank you for listening. I would also like to end by thanking the NPTEL staff for facilitating the recording and editing and so on. They have come during all days including Saturdays in order to do this. It is a lot of work. And I would like to in particular mention Soju Francis for going through the painstaking job of editing all my lectures. Thank you. Have fun.